Welcome everyone. My name is Stefan Verhulst. I'm the co-founder of GovLab, which is an action research center based in New York and part of New York University. Thanks for joining this special event, which will involve sharing the findings of our data assembly, which was the first ever citizen assembly around the use of data for COVID-19 within New York City. And we will share the findings today, followed by a set of reactions by key stakeholders uh, who will reflect on what it means from their perspective on how to move forward with regard to the use of data in a responsible way to address COVID-19. But before we go there, let me briefly introduce uh, what we try to do with the data assembly. And obviously the background of the data assembly is COVID-19. And what is at stake is of course, what is happening right now, uh, which is a major human tragedy. Uh, within New York City, we've had more than a quarter million infections. And obviously many people uh, have lost their lives as a result of the pandemic. But the pandemic has not only been a tragedy from a medical point of view, it obviously has meant that many have lost their jobs, many have lost their uh, uh, income, and many of those businesses have also been forced to close uh, doors or at least operate in less than optimal uh, conditions. And so when we looked, and typically at GovLab, how we look at problems is also trying to understand what are the kinds of assets that we can leverage in order to address some of the problems that we see happening in society. Next slide, please. And one of the assets that we have worked on a lot at GovLab is data as an asset in order to improve the way we go about decision-making. And clearly, we have already seen that data brings huge opportunities to really understand the scale of the pandemic and the scale of the impact that the pandemic has on New York and its residents. But it also, of course, has a set of uh, risks associated with regard to uh, the impact of the use of data on people's liberties and people's also sense of trust in government and trust in the way uh, we go about responding to COVID-19. And so in order to understand um, what are the opportunities, but more importantly, also to understand what are the expectations of people with regard to the use of data to respond to COVID-19, we decided to pioneer one of the first ever citizens' assemblies around the reuse of data. I mean, while a lot of uh, uh, discussion takes place around data, too often we don't really engage with citizens or residents on what their expectations are and how they feel data should be used. And so that was the initial intent behind the data assembly, was to really pioneer a new methodology on how you engage with what we call mini publics, i.e. representatives of uh, uh, society, and try to understand what are their um, expectations and also their concerns and their proposals with regard to how data should be used. And so what we've been doing the last uh, three months, and some of you, uh, uh, or four months already, some of you uh, were part of this, we have uh, held three mini publics, one that involved data holders and the public uh, uh, officials that are actually interested in, in accessing data and reusing data for COVID-19. Another mini public involved civic uh, rights organizations and uh, organizations that represent the public interest within and across New York. And then lastly, of course, we also had a engagement with 50 uh, randomized selected New Yorkers and try to understand what are their views with regard to the use and the reuse of data as it relates to COVID-19. We couldn't do all of this without our partners and we had some amazing partners that are also part of this uh, panel. Of course, Henry Luce Foundation was our partner both financially but also in thinking through how to design a data assembly in a manner that is effective and also legitimate. 
And of course, we also had the library system, both the New York uh, Public Library and the Brooklyn Public Library, co-hosting some of our deliberations that we've held in order to solicit the input and the expectations of the public. And so, next slide. Uh, just to reiterate, what we hope to do by engaging with those many publics was to identify what are the concerns, what are the expectations, and also what do people feel are the opportunities of actually reusing data. And we use the term reusing data because we deliberately didn't uh, uh, engage the public on uh, collecting more data, but it was really about how do we start reusing data that already has been collected in a variety of ways and by a variety of actors within the city. We didn't only uh, solicit uh, expectations and opinions. We also asked many stakeholders about what do you believe uh, uh, are then the conditions and the procedures that should be in place for reuse. And we will share some of those cross-cutting findings with regard to emerging principles for the reuse of data within New York City. And then ultimately that led to this co-design of a data responsibility framework. Next slide. So what we hope to do today is to introduce, and Andrew will uh, give an overview of what we have found so far, introduce some of the findings with regard to a responsible reuse framework, and then more importantly, to engage the panelists on what they believe the opportunities and the risks are. But before we go into the panel, Andrew, you might want to share some of the top level findings of the uh, mini publics that we've held so far. Great, thanks so much, Stefan. Um, so the GovLab team synthesized the key points raised during these three mini public deliberations to identify some of the key elements that can support responsible data reuse in the response to COVID-19 in New York City and beyond. And we have those listed here. Um, the deliberations made it clear that there are several important issues that policymakers and practitioners can take into account to increase the responsibility of their data work. These elements are presented as a package of guidelines or suggestions. Um, individual issue, issues raised here are unlikely to create a major impact if they are deployed in isolation. Uh, it's evident that achieving responsible data reuse necessitates a more multifaceted type of strategy. So as you can see here, the elements of the responsible data reuse framework that was informed by our data assembly deliberations span five main areas. The first one is why a data reuse project is happening, including issues like ensuring the work is directed at achieving a specific well-defined purpose rather than broad or speculative aspirations. The second is around what data is being reused with a focus on ensuring adequate levels of aggregation and anonymization to guard against privacy harms and the like. The third element is around who is involved in the work, including especially engagement with the intended beneficiaries of the data reuse project, and a lot of discussion around prioritizing work led by city government and community-based organizations rather than actors operating at the state or national level. Next is issues around how the data reuse project operates, um, including uh, elements around engaging residents, obtaining meaningful consent, and fostering data literacy. Next issues around when data reuse should, should occur, um, prioritizing appropriate data retention strategies rather than a keep everything type uh, approach where indefinite data retention is, is advanced. And then finally, issues around where the project occurs, uh, taking into account place-based opportunities and risks, especially um, in projects that involve some type of geolocation data in their workings. So I'm not going to discuss each of these elements at length now, um, but they're all described in much more detail in the draft report and framework that will be shared with you all for review and comment after uh, the event today. So the elements of the responsible data reuse framework that I just discussed uh, provide policymakers and practitioners with more nuanced guide, more nuanced guidance across this why, who, what, when, where, and how of data reuse. 
Uh, but the data assembly deliberations also yielded five more cross-cutting foundational recommendations that could help these actors advance responsible data reuse for COVID-19. So the first of these more cross-cutting recommendations is the issue of matching urgency with accountability. Uh, participants in all three of the mini publics expressed a willingness to tolerate increased levels of surveillance for public health purposes. However, this expanded support for data collection and data reuse does not excuse organizations from abiding by responsible data practices and other basic duties of care. Organizations should provide mechanisms that guarantee public oversight of their actions and provide opportunities for public input and accountability. The second recommendation is around supporting and expanding data literacy. Uh, though recent events have prompted more awareness of data reuse, many stakeholders still lack knowledge of relevant data practices and terminology. Um, as such, meaningful public participation in a data reuse effort, such as obtaining meaningful consent, um, depends on communications with the public and other stakeholders being clear, well justified, and broadly understandable. The third element uh, or third recommendation is around centering equity. Uh, data reuse can yield substantial benefits for a community, but these benefits are not always distributed to those who need them most. Uh, in the three mini publics, participants noted the potential for data reuse projects to miss subsets of the population or otherwise exacerbate existing inequalities. Uh, so care should be taken to avoid overlooking these data invisibles or feeding into existing power asymmetries. Next recommendation is around engaging legitimate local actors. Uh, participants in the three mini publics highlighted the need for effective public engagement and leadership from local actors in government and civil society. Uh, the deliberations also point to the importance of involving trusted intermediary organizations that can help to engage with and solicit input from target beneficiary communities uh, related to a, a certain data reuse project. And then finally, our fifth recommendation uh, of the cross-cutting nature is to develop positions for responsible data reuse. Um, so data reuse projects are, as evidenced here, complex undertakings that require coordination with various actors inside and outside of an organization. Um, dedicated job positions and responsibilities devoted to these issues can allow organizations to better respond to new circumstances as they arise uh, in our work at GovLab we call people in these positions data stewards. So again, the considerations and recommendations that I just described um, are discussed in much more detail in, in our preliminary report, um, and we're eager to share that for review and comment coming out of uh, this event today. So I will leave it there and hand it back over to Stefan to introduce our expert panel. Great, thanks so much, Andrew, and uh, thanks for being able to summarize this in two slides. Uh, uh, we have the report uh, also available for those who wants to read it into more detail and especially provide additional comments uh, uh, available uh, because we deliberately didn't want to use this event to launch the report but actually to share the interim findings and have also uh, people from the public to be able to reflect and comment on some of the findings that we are still able to uh, integrate. And I do want to emphasize is that the recommendations that um, uh, obviously uh, Andrew shared are not recommendations that uh, uh, GovLab uh, came up with, but are the recommendations that emerged as a result of those deliberations. And, uh, and I think it's important to emphasize that these are actually really, what I thought, fairly sophisticated uh, 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 recommendations coming out of this deliberation process, which shows the value and potential of deliberation with a group or with those mini publics as we have uh, experienced. Now, uh, what I would love to do now is to actually solicit uh, our panelists to reflect on both the findings of the report and the recommendations, but more importantly, to also share their point of view with regard to the opportunities that data might have at the time of uh, uh, COVID-19. And obviously we're still in the midst of the pandemic and, uh, uh, and you, uh, the panelists might of course, either have experience with using data that shows the value, but also might still uh, feel like more needs to be done. But then also uh, in addition to the opportunities, what are some of the risks 
that uh, New Yorkers and New York City should be aware of uh, moving forward with regard to the data we use for COVID-19 and how does it relate to some of the um, findings and recommendations that our mini publics already surfaced as well. So we have a stellar panel and I'm quickly gonna uh, not introduce but just uh, um, 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 indicate who is on the panel today and then I will invite everyone uh, also to briefly introduce yourself and especially how it relates to some of the topics. Um, today we have uh, Mariko Silver who is the president of uh, the Henry Luce Foundation. We have Gail Brewer who is uh, probably uh, known to everyone on this uh, call and is the Manhattan Borough uh, President. We have Nick uh, Smith who is the first deputy public uh, advocate uh, of uh, New York City. We have um, Diana Plunkett from uh, Brooklyn Public Library where she is the manager of strategic uh, initiatives. We have Kathleen uh, Wigglehout who is the uh, associate director uh, for digital policy at New York uh, Public Library. We have Paul Coe, who is head of uh, LinkedIn Economic Graph Analytics uh, at LinkedIn, of course. We have Jacqueline uh, Sawyer, who is director, data systems breaking ground. And last but not least, we have Zachary Feeder, who is the open data program manager for the New York City's Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. So as you can see, we have a tremendous uh, panel. And uh, without further ado, let me start with Mariko. And uh, Mariko, if you could uh, give us your views, first of all, perhaps of uh, why you felt a data assembly was important uh, to support, but more importantly, what you feel uh, some of the opportunities might be that we still uh, need to consider. And then also, of course, uh, some of the risks that we should be uh, aware of and that we might want to include moving forward as well. Over to you, Mariko. Thanks so much, Stefan and Andrew. Um, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with all, all of these folks who know far more than I do, so I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to go first. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we supported this work because uh, in general, uh, I think there is not enough public conversation about data use and reuse. Um, there's not enough um, robust public discourse on an ongoing basis um, because this is a, a process. Um, I think the idea that we would make a set of decisions about uh, data use or reuse, even in, in a particular instance like COVID and have that be a kind of one and done uh, is probably the wrong frame. That in fact, the kind of trust building that's required to make this data really useful um, requires us to be engaged in ongoing conversations within communities, across communities, kind of up and down various decision-making hierarchies. And we don't really have good structures for that, uh, broadly speaking, um, in the United States. We don't have good structures, certainly up to the federal level, which is what I know best. We don't have good structures um, at the state level. We probably have some better infrastructure for those conversations at the city level, which is why I felt it was really important to have that kind of local anchoring um, and maybe ideally over time build up from there a set of processes for that kind of nested trust building as a way of engaging in ongoing democratic practice. Um, that will inform policy making at multiple levels, including, by the way, ideally, policy making uh, at private corporations. We've kind of entered into this phase where we have a whole bunch of assumptions about how much data is going to get sucked up, essentially, when we sign up to use a variety of different services, whether those are private sector uh, delivered and designed services or they're public sector services. Um, I, I spent some time in the Obama administration working at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I know uh, too well how much the tendency is, certainly at the federal government level, to kind of just suck in the data. Um, and then in too many cases, I think, uh, see what you're gonna do with it later. And I think a lot of that ethos is also present in the private sector and technology sector. There are others on the, this panel who can speak to that more directly than I can, but a tendency to suck up the data and then decide later uh, what we think we can do with it. And I think one of the things that's really important to, to anchor ourselves in that we heard from these mini publics that I would guess, but this is a testable assumption, maybe for another project, is a broadly held view uh, among the American public um, that actually that's not what we want. 
We don't want the data to be sucked up and then see what you can do with it, right? We want clear, transparent, accessible, ongoing conversation um, and uh, data use and reuse that is purpose limited, time limited, um, and that it, we don't have this kind of great sloshing around inside the, inside the big vacuum cleaner uh, that I think we've all become, frankly, way too accustomed to, in part because the downstream impacts of that are not broadly understood or it's hard to wrap your mind around and hard for me to wrap my mind around, I'll just speak for myself. Uh, I think the other thing that's really evident in the, um, the process that, that you all used um, is the importance of trusting communities to know their own best interests. I think there's so much tendency to, when we think about, for example, data in the aggregate, you know, wrapping things up um, to make policy, to assume that the data will give us the answer. Actually, the people will give us the answer and the data can be used to implement what communities want. Um, so we need to uh, invert or, or flip uh, some of those frames. And I think these, are, uh, these conversations provide real opportunities to do that. Um, in terms of the, um, the opportunities specific to COVID, um, others can probably speak more clearly to that, but I think uh, coming from the, the results of the mini publics, some sense that there is a value in, in ag appropriately aggregated and anonymized um, geographically based data to understand the movement of the pandemic across geography. Um, and particularly too, and we didn't maybe get to this in this particular instantiation of the project, but understanding also long-term health impacts, long-term economic impacts. Um, but that requires, as I say, that kind of ongoing looping discussion about what do we really want to use this data for? Um, and clearly it's for service provision. Um, it's not only for control with the capital C, right? It's for service provision, it's for community-driven uh, interests and support. In terms of risks, um, there's always the risk of community uh, stigma or, or blaming um, in some way, and I think we have to be alive to that. Um, the biggest risk, in my view, of the data reuse piece of it is that kind of sloshing around so the data that's collected for one purpose gets deployed for another purpose without people being aware or understanding that that's what they, uh, they signed up for. Um, and you know, I think that the one thing that, that did jump out at me in some of the, um, the, the findings and the, the, the views that were expressed is the idea of open data so that people can actually engage in adjusting their own behavior, by right? giving people data so that they themselves can have uh, the power and control uh, over their own, uh, whether it's movements around the, the city in the New York City case or um, its engagements with certain kinds of services so that they can engage in um, adjusting uh, their own expectations also uh, as it relates to uh, COVID. I think one of the things that we're all finding in this time when we're talking about the, the health effects of the, of the pandemic in terms of pandemic transmission, but there's also obviously the enormous mental health strain of people trying to make all of these decisions to optimize for their families or to just uh, try not to, to minimize the danger. Uh, for themselves and their families and the more data we can put in people's hands to make informed decisions uh, on that front i think the better so i'll stop there thanks so much i look forward to hearing everybody else thanks mariko and thanks for for this wonderful opening uh and i think uh you hit uh, uh several issues that i'm sure others will probably come back to as well so thanks for setting the stage here uh, uh so well so next um gail uh uh viewer uh, I mean, as Manhattan Borough President, uh, you've been actually a leader on, on many topics uh, related to data and technology. And so eager to hear what your um, uh, views are and also concerns are with regard to uh, reuse of data as it relates to the pandemic. Gail, you're, up, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you. I have so many horrible Zooms on real estate and, oh, God knows what other issues. So this is a pleasure. You cannot imagine. So uh, thank you, Seven. Thank you, Andrew. And of course, um, Mariko gave a brilliant overview. So, uh, you know, this pandemic has opened up lots of data challenges that are not being addressed, the ones that I'm not going to talk about, but it's all about the schools and the students and the devices. And without getting into the example, I can't even tell you in Manhattan, because I spent a lot of time on this, that we have that data. 
and and of course the the seniors with their devices and of course the telemedicine and the housing the list goes on so if we we always hear about the challenges that this pandemic has opened up but the lack of data is as you suggest a big one i'm just going to talk about small businesses nick knows that for uh the last 20 years i have been talking about small business and the mom and pops i hate 7-eleven i hate cvs and i really do uh want these local ones to survive so here we are in 2020 and the pandemic and guess what we're facing even more what about our mom and pops so uh, a few years ago in 2017, we walked from the bottom of Broadway to the top of Broadway uh, just to see how many were vacant. Um, and it was 188. And then we ran uh, literally uh, with interns up and down Broadway again in August of this year. And there were a 78% increase of vacancies. And so now of course that was 335. Now you can argue, I bet right now there are even more. But why is this important on a data issue is the following that um, we passed a bill in uh, local law 157 in 2019, way before thinking that the pandemic, uh, it's gonna go into effect in 2019. I did it when I was in the city council. And what this bill basically states is that by uh, February of 2021, Every property owner in the city of New York, again, this was done way before the pandemic, has to tell the Department of Finance how many vacancies on your storefront, what's the square footage, and there's a whole list of things that have to be uh, stated in your information. Boy, will that make a difference because we don't really know. We can talk about mom and pops are getting hurt. We can talk about their vacancies, but it's all made up. It has no base except only will it have some information if we have this data. Nobody's ever collected this data before. And of course, getting the Department of Finance to do it correctly is also gonna be a challenge because they too are understaffed and Zoom and so on and so forth. But that's an example for me where we all talk about the need for local, but we don't do it. The second reason it's important is I'm the only elected to actually pass the law specifically uh, about zoning and small business. It's the Upper West Side, uh, commercial corridor law. The owners of the buildings hate it. The real estate people hate it. But what it says is that you can't have a bank larger than 25 feet between 72nd and 110th. And on Amsterdam and Columbus, your storefront can't be larger than 40 feet. Everybody who's in there who's larger is grandfathered in. Today, literally today and yesterday and the day before, I get calls either I want to add from the 40 feet or I want to you know cut up something so but we don't have the data so we don't know if this is something that makes sense or doesn't make sense so I, I would just give this as, as an example of um, when you're trying to plan for the streetscape and the uh, storefronts which are if you ask any New Yorker they love their family they love their car they love their dog but guess what else they love their local pharmacy, their local bodega. And in fact, during the pandemic, I think those two kept us going over and over again. We don't know if we're gonna have them in the future, but if we have the data, then maybe we could help to plan to work with the owners. Where there's the business improvement district, there often is that kind of support, but generally not. So here to me is one of the greatest example of how you can help the city bounce back when you have something like this, we're all talking about the health pandemic and the eco economic pandemic. Those two need to work together. And of course we hear about, you know, Midtown doesn't have uh, any offices that are populated and therefore the vendor and the coffee shop are not working. We don't have any data. So to me, this is an example of how data can really, really help us plan. Uh, what's the lost revenue? When you have a vacancy, you got to be able to look at it because the store next door that does have an occupant is so hurt. The homeless gather, the litter gathers, and the whole block is destroyed in terms of economic opportunity. So that's, to me, an example of data being necessary. I guess you could call it reuse, but it never existed in the first place. Then there's the issue of, you know, how, what's the... Um, the data that policymakers and practitioners must have in order to 
is, uh, as you have said, mitigate or make policy in the future. Everybody knows, and perhaps my proudest moment in the city council was sponsoring and passing the New York City's open data law. And I wanna thank everybody from the mayor's office that keeps it going, but guess who is responsible for that law? It's a woman named Beth Novick. Because if it wasn't for her, then that law would never have passed. She sat there in a coffee shop with me because nobody wanted to pass this law. The police department was against me, even Mr. Bloomberg, Mr. Data, no, not so interested. But anyway, we did pass it. It's been uh, changed a few times. So what do we use it for in our office, in the borough president's office? And again, you, you'll hear more about it. I'm responsible of many things, but one of them is the community boards. And in the borough of Manhattan, there are 12, 600 members. We also appoint cultural boards, hospital boards, solid waste advisory boards, it's about a thousand people. And they, until this law passed, not only do city agencies not have the data, and guess who likes the open data most, although they won't tell you, are city agencies. So they had no idea what the other city agency was doing, and they didn't even know what the databases were. So leave that aside. Now we are in 2020, um, and even in 2019, working with the community, as you said earlier, because it's fine for academics and it's fine for the real estate industry to have this data. But community people want to know what's going on in their block. As a Manhattanite, I don't give whatever about Brooklyn, and I certainly don't care about the Bronx. But I want to know what's going on in Manhattan, and I want to know what's going on in my community, and if best, I like to know what's going on in my block. That's how people are. They really want to know that. So the idea, of course, generally, is to you know figure out what is how do you improve the transparency how do you unlock the data for the public and you break it down so that local people can understand it so with beta nyc which is a nonprofit that looks at this as you probably know because they have a conference every year they actually are located in our office in the municipal building and they have for the last five or six years worked with cuny fellows 12 to 15 and then those CUNY fellows are trained, and boy, they've gone on to good jobs, to work at the data. They look at the data, they understand the data, and then they take it to the community boards. And the community boards are learning how to unlock that data every single day so that when they have a meeting, land use, or they have a meeting on God help us, the restaurant state liquor authority, that's the worst meeting of all to talk about who gets the outdoor cafe and who doesn't, you don't wanna hear about that. But it's good to know where the other uh outdoor cafes where are the other bars where is the church where is the school etc because you can all say i think there's one down the street that's usually how it's done much better to have the data we're not quite there i'd like to have enough uh, literally hardware in the community board offices and in the you know uh synagogue church basement where they meet where there's no uh, internet so you can't bring the you know it's, it's a lot of challenges but the point is uh we need to have that data just as another example on how you deal what about the schools what school has enough bandwidth to be able to handle every single student for high school doing a video learning about their community the answer is none but you don't have that data because you don't really know because getting that data you got to get it out of the department of education you got to get it into the community same thing was i indicated with the state liquor authority same thing with, we're trying to work with the court system. We've met with everybody. What is the eviction data? I want to know who, I don't want to know when Mrs. McGillicuddy is out on the street with her suitcase. I want to know when Mrs. McGillicuddy is getting her eviction notice. I don't want to hear about the sheriff. I want to know in advance. That data is not yet available, we're close. Just to give an example of how you deal with communities and figuring out how you can be more responsible to their challenges. Religious churches and synagogues. I think the mosques and the temples, not so much. I swear that every reverend, priest, and rabbi, as soon as a developer says, oh, I'd be glad to have your building, and I'll make a nice condo above, and then you can have mission in the first two floors, which point I go eight because I don't want the church torn down. I don't want the synagogue torn down. And guess what? They sign up. 
And then that's the end of that beautiful building. So we now, as a result of all this effort, we have a list now of every non-landmark. If I could landmark every church and synagogue, I would, you know, but I can't. Every non-landmark faith-based institution in the lower Manhattan, and I know exactly where they are. So I'm now in charge of trying to work with the task force, with the developers, making sure that people don't sign up with their parishioner, who's such an expert on land use, but they don't know shit about land use. They need to have somebody who does. And so we have a whole uh, booklet we put together, but only because we have the data. There are 196 religious facilities in Manhattan that have no historic designation, and they're ready to be developed if we don't make sure that they don't. So you can see that all of this, I could go on and on about the ways in which we have used this data for the community boards. But um, we need from New York State a lot of data. We need daily trends of fatalities. We need daily trends of hospitalization. Uh, we get some of the ICU patients, as you know, and as I mentioned, we definitely need from the court system, which is a state issue, the data on eviction. Um, we also, there's all the issues of food resources, which unfortunately has become even more necessary during this pandemic. And we need obviously lots of transportation data. We need the outdoor seating. We need in the city of New York, as an example, I would call it a open street czar or a public uh, realm czar. Somebody who takes a look at the city, the bicycles, the pedestrians, the skateboards, the, you know, the accessor rides, the trucks, the open plazas, the homeless, etc. You can't do that without data. Um, you, you have to know what are all of the activities that are taking place in our streets. As an example, from Department of Sanitation, I love the outdoor restaurants. What, guess what they don't do? They don't clean around the edges of their outdoor restaurant, and then the sanitation sweeper, they can't do that. So how many of them are, where are they, and exactly what is sanitation going to do with that information? You need somebody who's going to put all those agencies together. So I hope that gives you a sense of on the ground uh, what we're trying to do with this data and what you can do with this data because there are so many possibilities. I do think the city is, is keeping it because, uh, you know, it has to be real time. It has to be put in correctly. And as Beth told me years ago, your main audience is not the public. Your main audience are the city wonderful staff who are getting this data into uh, the open data platform because they're the ones who can make it or make it or not make it. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Gail, for that. And it really grounds the discussion in uh, uh, why we need data and also what are the kinds of uh, decisions that it can inform. And so much appreciated for grounding this discussion in indeed your daily lived experience. And, and obviously, I will let Beth know that she uh, uh, got some extra credits <laughs> here as well. Um, with that, uh, let's let's go to Nick. And uh, Nick, uh, uh, you of course have also thought about um, the uh, role of data and also the risks of data uh, from the public advocate's point of view. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Stefan. And it's good to see all of you, including uh, our friend, the, the Burr President of Manhattan. Uh, you know, you don't follow Gail Brewer, particularly on the issue of technology. This is, you know. Uh, one of her many areas of expertise, but I'm happy to try to do so. I do think Gail did give it a good sort of uh, framework as to all the the sort of interlocking or interconnected uh, issues that folks in the government that is uh, elected or uh, staff uh, have to deal with when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't though zoom out just a little bit when it comes to data um, and talk about uh, going back to uh, March at the beginning uh, of this crisis. And I'm not trying to be political, but I think it's good to establish uh, some facts. Uh, so from, from our perspective, uh, what we saw was, you know, rumblings of, you know, uh, COVID-19 uh, coming in, into New York City through JFK or the other places. And then, uh, and then we didn't really hear much until we started seeing um, hospitalizations and unfortunately uh, fatalities. And then when we start to look at, to sort of parse out what was really happening, they would begin to immediately see um, sort of disparate impact on di uh, disparate communities like people of color um, uh, who uh, were uh, top of the list of hospitalizations, top of the list, unfortunately, on fatalities. 
Um, and that as a starting point was, I think for folks in government, shocking, uh, well, no, frightening, but not shocking, unfortunately, because what I, what I think COVID exposed was a, a very long standing um, system where people of color in particular haven't been receiving uh, the healthcare and other uh, sort of wider ranging resources uh, that we need to be healthy uh, and separate from actual health, but related uh, to, you know, uh, sit in jobs and careers um, that are not uh, centered necessarily on uh, what came to be, which are uh, most of us uh, being the frontline workers as well. So not only did, did people of color experience the, the highest of the, the hospitalizations and the fatalities, but also uh, the majority of folks who, when we sort of locked down and went on pause, had to go to work. So all that uh, is, in fact, um, data which is important. Um, and I think, uh, and again, not to be political, but to say what we think is a fact, I think had the federal government in particular, but also I think state and city, not talking about the BP, I'm talking about the, the president and other executives, um, um, the governor and mayor, had they really took that information, the data that we saw early on and, and shared it among themselves and then among us, uh, others who are in government and, and the public, I think we would have, uh, I think firstly, uh, paused or locked down much more quickly. And I think even a week earlier or two weeks earlier, uh, many say we would have saved uh, lives. So that's for, for our office and for me in particular, the starting point. And then I think emanating from that as the borough president was going through so many issues that we see, uh, which is she mentioned issues of the technology of kids and, and you know iPads going to students and tech going to seniors. Our office has just seen, and like I know Gail has just a lot of those uh, complaints. Um, so when it comes to, I think, what, what are the opportunities for uh, clear data on all this stuff is very clear. We may be going into a second wave right now, may not be. Uh, so the question is right now, how do we immediately respond? And then as a matter of uh, electeds and advocates going forward, how do we prevent the level of devastation that we've seen in, 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 in uh, hospitalizations and fatalities? Well, that does require us to look at all of the data, whether it's demographics, uh, whether it's the movement of people, uh, whether it's what careers uh, 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 we're going to, or what jobs people are uh, occupying and why, et cetera. So again, all that is uh, critical. And I feel like in a broad sense, in a macro level, if the federal government, state government, and local government really uh, look at it from that perspective, I actually think, and I'm not a, a doctor, um, but I do think there is a way to at least reduce or stem the sheer um, devastation that we've seen uh, in 2020, and it's been a very challenging year. And so again, as we even talk through data, it's important to remember that behind every piece of data are people, right? So, um, you know, our prayers for healing and comfort to the families of, of those we've lost and, and those who are on the front lines uh, helping us to recover from this crisis. And the Public Advocates Office, uh, just to give a bit of rep as to our role, uh, we are considered the city's uh, arms buds person. Also, we receive complaints about city services, uh, and as a result, try to uh, respond. So when it comes to data in specific, uh, I think, you know, folks have expressed concern, for example, when it comes to an app that the governor uh, put out to help track um, COVID cases, we have gotten complaints and questions and concerns like, hey, you know, I put this app, you know, on my uh, phone, uh, but one, what information am, am I putting out there? Where is it going? Is it going to some private third party who's going to sign a contract and sell that data? Is it going to be housed in the, the, the city government? You know, where is that stuff going to go? Um, and then secondarily, how is my information uh, going to be protected if I install this app on this device, you know, I'm being tracked, I'm, I'm giving my personal information, et cetera. So um, I, in response to public advocate, myself and the team, we've sent communications to the governor and the mayor, but the governor in particular as the one who, who uh, initiated, outline those concerns. And so we still hope to hear back uh, from his team and his shop um, on the risk of the app uh, in particular. Um, so you know, to kind of wrap up, I think there is a great opportunity here in terms of understanding the interdisciplinary issues as it uh, relates to COVID. Uh, our mandate and mission is to protect New Yorkers all across uh, the city. Uh, so like right now, understanding, for example, with the possible second wave, 
where do we think based on uh, population patterns, spending patterns, 311 calls, the open data uh, uh, information that the borough president herself passed uh, as a law many years ago. Um, so, so give us a picture of what, what's happening and let's not be uh, reactive uh, as we I think largely have been uh, you know, up front. Let's try to be proactive and figure out uh, where do you anticipate hotspots being? And for example, to respond, let's go to those communities. Let's engage in uh, outreach to the, the populations that we think may be hard to reach or that may need PPE or that, you know, uh, you know, our frontline workers. Let's go out there. Let's explain, you know, hey, we're all New Yorkers, but in this area, we do see a certain difference in um, possible infection rates based on various factors. All of that does require data and information. So that is the opportunity and that is also uh, the risk. But just to wrap, I, I feel like uh, if those in government in, in collaboration with GovLab and, and all of our partners uh, on the ground understand the opportunities and the risk, we'll be in a much better position to uh, protect New Yorkers I guess what I think will be a second wave. And also if something like this happens again, and President Obama many years ago said, we will likely see in a few years, something like uh, COVID-19 occur, how we can help, if, if we can't prevent it because it's, it's just so aggressive, how we can again mitigate uh, the effects. So that's um, what I have to say about the opportunities uh, and the risk. And I thank all of you for the time. Um, I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nick, and, and very valuable to, to also learn what, uh, what are some of the complaints that you hear, because uh, indeed, as, as Mariko said, is that you know, there are systems in place to actually engage with and learn from uh, people. And of course, the public advocate's role is key in that kind of feedback loop on uh, what people also uh, experience and what their concerns are. And thanks for sharing that as well. Um, let's go uh, to the libraries and uh, Deanna, uh, you, of course, represent here the Brooklyn uh, Library uh, uh, System, and we were delighted to partner with you and with the New York uh, Public Library as well to co-host some of those initiatives. And would love to hear from you um, also what you, anyway, felt was the role of libraries in this space, uh, because I do believe that libraries are quite often trusted institutions that can actually do play an important role uh, around data as I said before on numerous occasions. And so eager to learn from you, Diana, very shortly also what you see are the opportunity and risks. Yes, thank you. Um, it's a, uh, following Gail and Nick is a challenge, but we'll, we'll do our best here. Um, all of you, uh, I think are aware of the situation we're in in the city, um, we feel things in particular at the moment in Brooklyn. Um, but we are, as a library, very pleased to uh, support and participate in conversations like this. Um, there are sort of two facets to our involvement at, at the library and our interest. Uh, one is uh, very much supporting these kinds of civic dialogues. Uh, we feel that that is crucial to make sure that the population uh, is very locally, uh, I think as Gail made the point, uh, we'll take care of Brooklyn, Gail, we got it. Um, so, uh, but that uh, each of our branches is very much the center of their communities. And so having these types of conversations and finding ways to make this very hyper-local is, is very much a part of what we're interested in. Um, in addition, uh, as a, a library, we feel very strongly both uh, the need to protect our patrons' privacy um, and also uh, understanding the value of free and transparent flow of information uh, and data is information in our world and so that matters and we very strongly feel that these two can both be served uh, if we are thoughtful and careful about the use and reuse of data um, so we think that uh, we can both protect our patrons privacy and uh, facilitate the free and transparent use and in fact that transparency in some sense um, help support the 
need for privacy. Um, because the more people know, and I think, uh, Gail, you touched on this, and no, maybe Mariko, you touched on this in your comments, that the, the transparency of what's being collected, the more people know about that, uh, the easier it is for people to understand what they're opting into or not. Um, so along with that, we also feel that uh, education efforts are very, very important to all of this. Um, and we see data literacy as part of the literacy uh, that we are responsible for uh, shepherding in our communities and want to work with any of you on the panel or anybody else who's interested uh, to really help our patrons uh, and our communities uh, understand more about what's involved in these conversations um, and really uh, generate some education at the local level so that people can participate more fully in these conversations, uh, knowing what's right for them and their families and their communities. Um, we share some of the concerns about people being invisible um, and, and that matters and we need to pay attention to that. Um, at the library, we've been building a data culture internally and we talk about data informed decisions because you can't make data driven decisions. Data are just one facet to how you make decisions. Um, so we think about the use of data as just one of the many tools that you can use to put together along with other knowledge and awareness to, to make decisions about what's right. Um, and then uh, one final shout out for uh, open data uh, and some thanks to Zach. Uh, we have actually been using the New York City health open data to help us understand where there are uh, issues in the Brooklyn communities uh, and where those overlay with our branches and how that needs to impact uh, opening and closings in, in those particular areas so that we can work to keep both our patrons and our staff safe as situations evolve. Um, so the, the use of that data cross agency um, is, is exactly the kind of thing that we're doing and we appreciate that that's available to help us as we go through this. Great, thanks so much, uh, Diana, and, and thanks for also making the point, indeed, uh, that uh, A, the libraries have a role to play, but also, of course, it's crucial to also establish a certain level of data literacy to actually be able to engage uh, as well in a sophisticated manner, and especially in a manner that uh, raises uh, the concerns of the public at large. Um, Kathleen, uh, you uh, represent the New York uh, public libraries and so um, eager to hear from you as well on um, anyway what, uh, what what was your rationale to also join this as a co-host and uh, and anyway anything that resonated with uh, Diana uh, said as well yes um, so good afternoon and uh, I want to on behalf of the library Stefan thank you and Andrew and your colleagues for inviting the New York Public Library to participate in, in the effort. Um, so I think I may uh, have very similar comments to um, Diana, but wanted to share a little bit about why the library joined uh, the data assembly in hosting the forums, um, bringing together stakeholders to consider how to develop principles around data reuse, um, especially in this moment uh, in our history. So I think it's helpful if I can ground our participation in the context of the library in digital space. So many of you probably know um, New York Public Library is one of three public library systems serving New York City. So along with Diana and colleagues in Brooklyn uh, and in Queens, we serve people who live uh, and or work in the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. We have a network of 88 branch libraries in nearly every community. They're, they're part of uh, their communities, I think I can say. And we have our digital resources, which um, really during this this moment, we just saw skyrocketing use, ebooks, databases, um, remote research assistance. We had all these other services that, that people were home um, really reached out to. Uh, that is also complemented. We have scholarly research centers uh, at 42nd Street uh, in Lincoln Center and Harlem's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Uh, those 
institutions, you know, we hold world-class collections, we provide service to a very local audience and international audience of researchers, creators, um, scholars. So uh, in the library, I'm a member of a team that we work to support the digital transformation of the library. So we, in this role, focus on the opportunities and risks associated with this transformation for our users, for our staff, and for our city, in a, in a broad, most broadly speaking. So as we develop new technologies, as we adopt new technologies, we prioritize privacy, accessibility, equity, impartiality and safety. So the, the shorthand really um, that we're committed to technology built and deployed in the public interest. So, you know, we, we're not here to uh, explicitly endorse the framework, but um, in walking, when Andrew's walking through it, there's so many things that resonate for us. Um, the goal of the effort being the thoughtful use of data and the approach, respecting, engaging citizens to drive decisions, that's consistent with our broader um, values and our approach. Um, we're really, I think, grateful for the exposure and training about data use for, for our staff too, um, who really are the front lines uh, for a lot of our, our public. So I think, you know, the, the first audience and the first way we're interested in um, data reuse is on behalf of our patrons. So, you know, we have people who rely on us for basic technology training. So it's, data literacy, it's digital literacy, um, that's all part of what we consider digital equity. So it's not just a digital divide, it's this equity and, and literacy and knowing what your data um, is and how it's used is part of that. Um, we also are one of the first institutions of our kind to release large scale data sets to the public for reuse. Um, so as we continue to focus, focus on publishing that material that's freely accessible, accessible for all, these are important conversations for us to be a part of. Um, and so we also consider ourselves experts in data in the physical context, and we're grappling it, with it in a digital context. Um, so again, this is, this is an important conversation for us to be part of. And then I think, you know, as a civic institution in New York, we're really dedicated to supporting efforts to strengthen the city. Um, the questions that, that this raised um, and, and the way that we're doing it, I think, sit at the intersection of all of our values. So um, we're grateful to have been part of the conversation and looking, uh, to, looking forward to being part of it um, as it continues. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Kathleen. And, and again, much appreciated for all your support and, uh, and also for your uh, kind words here uh, a second ago. Paul, you're, um, um, you're the um, the so-called private sector uh, representative on this uh, on this panel, so no pressure. Um, but uh, obviously, you uh, have done some pioneering work in actually the reuse of uh, data that LinkedIn has uh, in order to inform uh, uh, anyway uh, crises like COVID nineteen, but also of course to inform uh, the future of work. So eager to hear from you, Paul. Um, what you see are the opportunities, uh, some of the risks, and also um, some of the work that you've been doing, including with, uh, of course, New York City as well. Uh, eager to, to learn more about uh, your points of view here. Absolutely. So thanks for having me. I'm, uh, so really what my team is uh, mandated to do is to take insights from our economic graph, which we, all the information that is provided by members, by companies, um, by institutions and really surface them to policymakers, to researchers that need them the most. So our team has been exceptionally busy during this time because as you know, the COVID-19 has uh, massively accelerated data sharing niches among the public and private sector. And we need to get information, very timely information to get a better picture of rapidly evolving situations has been severely acute. So right now, policymakers, researchers, the private sector, we're all going forward as quickly as we can, and we're trying to be as careful as possible, but in surfacing much of the data, much of the information and doing these kind of collaborations and reuse of data, there are many sort of issues that we face that do need public deliberation, do need sort of public dialogue. Individual privacy as first and foremost, uh, the, the chief consideration for LinkedIn, because without members, without individuals actually using a platform and trusting us as a platform, we don't have um, a platform to, to begin with. 
So for us, preserving that is extremely, extremely important. However, the considerations that we go through are not necessarily the same as many other organizations. And as we're addressing these issues, both in this community sense, uh, conversations like these are, are critical. This public discourse, civic dialogue that enable transparency and educate the public. Um, you know, this is, as Mariko said, it's not a one and done conversation. The principles of data reuse that were outlined need to be continu continuously socialized, um, educated among the general public, and also internalized as principles as well. And so much of these principles that my team also kind of adheres by is it's something that the GovLab has outlined in a very, very clear way. And for, for us, because we're working so rapidly, a lot of these things kind of can go overlooked and it's not necessarily understood exactly how we're using these pieces of data, how we're surfacing a lot of this information. And uh, that is, I think, real crux of the problem is making sure that we continuously evaluate, continuously surface up what we are all doing to not only make the best use of the data, but to also ensure privacy and to ensure dialogue as well. So the most pressing use case that we have in addressing the immediate public health concerns have been coming from different sources of data like public health, uh, mobility data, search data, which are extremely applicable in these sort of public health um, concerns. So I think a lot of it is very obvious in terms of who you have been in contact with, uh, what kind of symptoms you might be searching for. All of these are very straightforward in a sense of uh, what's happening in a public health dialogue. However, one opportunity that goes a little past the immediate public health concerns are more in supporting public uh, poli and policymakers' current response and support of economic recovery. So much of Gail's comments about um, what is actually happening on the ground in terms of actually supporting businesses. Um, you know, my team at LinkedIn, really our data is better best position to provide information on the labor market. And so this is what um, you know, we draw upon from our economic graph to actually see what is happening on the ground. So what we've seen is um, a lot of adaptability from individuals on the ground. We see individuals taking on any sort of roles in order to adapt in a continuously changing environment. So to, to gain employment wherever they can. However, there's a great disparity in terms of the, um, you, you see that this can only go so far. And what we're trying to do is actually support a lot of the response and recovery with transitions data, such as the career transitions that people are making, the sort of demands and uptick. Um, one of the concerns that I think my team has is the market concentration. How many small businesses are closing? How many you know, businesses are not able to actually start? And small businesses represent the majority of a lot of hiring and uh, of new, the creation of new jobs and the driver of huge economic growth and innovation, and that's that's overly troubling to me. And I think providing that data in that context, supporting economic recovery is an extremely critical use case that is top of mind for my team. And Safan, you mentioned kind of a risk and what is the risk of doing that, doing a lot of this. And then definitely since we're coming from a very privacy focused standpoint, Really complete privacy, complete protection against misuse is doing nothing. I think this is a core risk though. So it's, um, it's so important that uh, we understand the risk to individual privacy and unintended consequences. Some of the findings that were surfaced in the data assembly it surfaced the new normal of data sharing, turning into the tools of the surveillance state and oppression um, are certainly top of mind issues too. Even for a platform like LinkedIn, which may seem innocuous, to certain issues, there these risks abound. Um, however, you know, doing nothing is not really an option during this time, and guaranteeing complete privacy is also, a, you know, is not possible in a data sharing kind of environment. So, what uh, the best we can do is foster that sort of transparency and dialogue. Uh, mitigating unintended consequences simply cannot be preserved when you're sharing data. It's just a fact. And I think for us having those discussions about how do we guard against those misuse? How do we guard against att attacks? And some of what the data assembly outlined in terms of um, having a very specific purpose in which you're able to go forward with sort of data partnerships and data reuse helps mitigate against what is the specific purpose and how is it intended to. And when you create as narrow a focus and trying to answer the question, again, we're not getting data for data's sake. We're getting people 
I think this was said in, in this forum, people answer questions. And what we're trying to do is use data to help illuminate the issue and uncover what the right answer is. And there are other sort of techniques as well that we can guard against such attacks. There's techniques such as differential privacy that preserve individual privacy. Um, I'm reminded of an episode with Netflix just back in 2006, and they published 10 million movie rankings among half a million viewers. And they issued it as a challenge, as a recommendation to improve their recommendation engine. So it was anonymized. They completely removed all their member privacy. But re researchers actually took that those timestamps and joined it against um, IMDb's issues and actually can back into the specific members and what they were watching too. So I think these, these un seemingly innocuous pieces of information just released as a general challenge um, have all of these unintended consequences. Now, a lot of this has been kind of scattershot in terms of uh, what principles we apply, what considerations we have, and what um, sort of guidelines that we need to adhere to. That's why I do think a lot of the findings from data assembly and in terms of actually having the active ongoing conversation are so incredibly important. The public familiar with these key concepts and the considerations highlighted in the framework are absolutely essential. Great, thanks so much, Paul. And, um, and, and thanks also to um, referencing some of the, the use cases that private sector data can, uh, can generate because there was a lot of discussion about open data and open government data, but I think indeed uh, private sector data has a, has a, a crucial role to play. Uh, and we do have to find as a society, we do have to find a way to uh, leverage that in a manner that is responsible, but also deals with some of the risks uh, inherent to the private sector uh, for actually uh, stepping up. Um, Jacqueline, uh, over to you. Uh, you, know, you are the um, director of data systems at uh, Breaking Ground. So I'm sure this is a topic that is close to your uh, to your heart. So any any reflections from your end, and then we're gonna we're gonna end with uh, uh, with Zach. And also, if any of the panelists want to react to any of the statements made, uh, uh, we will also have a moment uh, after uh, Zach's uh, interventions to do so. And then we can address some of the questions that are already in the um, chat here as well. Over to you, Jacqueline. Great. Yeah, it's, um, it's great to hear from everyone. And I think um, I've been... I, Definitely want to echo much of what's been said already. And I think I'm now reflecting on the role of the community based organization and um, a group that may provide social services within the city because I'm also a fan of open data. And I think early on, um, it really helped expand how we use data at Breaking Ground and think about problems differently and adding kind of geographical components. So I think just in general, I I think proper data reuse is, um, can be a really valuable asset in understanding your own data sets really well, um, even if it's only expressed within a closed network of information, um, something that is for internal use only to help you provide better services. Um, but I think coming into the data assembly, um, I was, of course, reflecting on how uh, we as an organization responded and aimed to manage uh, COVID-19 within our community. And we provide a spectrum of services across homeless street outreach, um, transitional housing, and permanent supportive housing. Um, so COVID was landing in many different ways um, within the, the community of breaking ground. Um, and so we were quickly trying to understand how this was going to impact um, staff, our tenants, our clients experiencing homelessness on the street, and really just kind of get our arms around as much information as possible to try to come up with some strategies for managing this and mitigating risk. And I think, so joining the data assembly, I really was kind of coming from this place of how do we, thinking about kind of lessons learned from how we tried to do it, and then also how can we share those lessons learned with other peer service organizations? And I think one thing that we always have to balance is that sometimes when we try to scale what worked for us up maybe to a city level or even just scale it up across other providers doing housing services in New York, it, it might not be a perfect solution um, for both use cases. And um, definitely 
the way that we responded was very custom built, born out of a lot of content expertise, knowing our community really well, having a strong presence. Um, and so I think that, you know, what works for us won't necessarily work for others. And I think definitely community-based organizations can, can be those, those bridges, can be, and I would say even further than a community-based organization, um, you know, community organizers are bridges and community members are the bridges. And really kind of like thinking how we can go a little bit deeper into hearing from, from people, from people who are experiencing this. And I think like one of the biggest opportunities that I was thinking about during the assembly is that I think this really helps us build new novel partnerships and collaborations. And we use the word collaboration all the time. And I really want to just kind of have us think about what that really looks like in action. Um, because I feel like rarely does one organization or institution have the deep content expertise, the community knowledge, or maybe wisdom that's born out of history or experience and deep technical know-how, maybe data available to them, the time, the resource, the capacity to be able to carry out their ideas. And so I think that um, how we share information, how we come together and build those partnerships might be the best way to set us up for re, you know, reopening New York and creating new sustainable channels of working together. And I think a lot of you have talked about kind of like this idea of like a common space or maybe this framework can present an opportunity for creating this, this commons that allows us all to kind of reorient to the work in this way so that we're we're crossing these public lines, the community-based organization lines, the industry lines, and we're actually not just giving data to each other, but actually figuring out new ways to have meaningful contributions to each other's um, pursuits. And just briefly, I mean, I think I, I tend to be more on the risk side of things and a little cautious with risk, but I think um, the opportunities are definitely there. And I think one of the big risks that, um, we might um, encounter is just like this loss of, of context and nuance when we start using um, information outside of the context that it was um, developed in. So um, I, I think it's very connected with the opportunity of pulling in content expertise and really getting community involvement and kind of this, this bottom up model. Um, I think that you definitely run the risk of um, yeah, just missing important features of the information when you're reusing data for another purpose. And I think um, there's a lot of great strategies of design justice that are looking at intersections of how, um, how design and power and oppression all interact and how what the information represents, how it could represent something completely different in another context. So I think just Again, uh, looking at the wisdom within our communities and figuring out what already exists and how to leverage that expertise. Great, wonderful, Jacqueline. Uh, really um, important uh, uh, reflections here. Um, for Zach, you have the, uh, and we're running uh, uh, short on time here, uh, so no pressure. Uh, Zach, you have one minute to react. No, I'm joking. But uh, uh, any, um, any reflections from your end? Obviously, this is something you are engaged with on a daily basis. Uh, and I can imagine that for every person that uh, made some intervention, you probably have a five minute uh, uh, response. So if you could be very shortly some reflections on I'll, what I'll, you I'll try to be brief. Um, what you thanks, see thanks as the opportunities. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, and, and thank you to the fellow panelists um, for what was really interesting. Um, interesting discussion. Um, first, I just want to say as one of the people responsible, one of the many people responsible for New York City Open Data, it's always wonderful to hear about people using it. Um, so, so thank you all for, for the, the mentions, um, and I think especially to Borough President Brewer and, and others who are responsible for its institution in New York City. Um, but thinking about the topic of data reuse and our office, so again, um, I'm at the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. And we help city agencies um, and the city answer questions with data. We foster data sharing between agencies and we help to run the city's open data program. Um, and data reuse and responsible data reuse is sort of fundamental to all of those things. We don't have data that we manage ourselves. We don't collect data ourselves. It, it took someone else um, taking that data, explaining it, packaging it, and, and sharing it, making it available to us for, for any of that work to happen. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about data reuse in general. 
And open data in particular is kind of predicated on the value that comes from that data sharing. Um, many of the principles was really thrilled to see um, that came out of the data assembly from these different mini publics are what we think of as core values when we're just working with the city data um, in, in general. And, and really, I think one of the fundamental, the fundamental theories of, of kind of action around open data that we've embraced is that the, there will be different perspectives and uses beyond those originally anticipated from sharing city government data with others. Um, so uh, two quick examples. One is just the health department's release of COVID data. This data was originally collected um, for, for use by health department epidemiologists, but the amount of different dashboards, the amount of engagement by members of the public, by news organizations around it, um, ha has, has really been far beyond anything, even given the, the centrality of the pandemic in everyone's mind, um, beyond the original intention of that data collection. Another um, is the road dimensions that were captured actually years and years ago um, through an aerial survey and was actually used um, to create this sidewalk with NYC map um, to look at the potential for social distancing in different areas of the city. So this idea that data was collected for one purpose, but can be used for many different purposes if it's used responsibly, um, is, is a really exciting one from the perspective of open data. As far as um, the, 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 the sharing of data with the public and the responsible sharing of data beyond open data, one of the things that we started to do, and this is in tandem with the Mayor's Office of Policy and Planning and also the Mayor's Office of Operations, um, it is create this framework called the Recovery Data Partnership. Um, and, and this was a way we could think about how do we take the, the information from organizations, all different organizations from around the city, and ingest that information and use that to help city staff make better decisions. Um, one of the things that we have for Open Day, we have this tremendous corpus of information from many, many facets of city life, but it's not every facet. And there are some areas, there are many areas that we just are not the best people to have, um, have this information. The agencies have specific missions. Those tend to be defined in something like a city charter. And beyond that, um, we really are looking to these other organizations to, I think as many of the panelists described, to make sure that we are getting information from different communities across the city. And actually one of the really the um, launch partners in the first cohort was, was LinkedIn and um, looking forward to having more, um, if you're interested in, in, in sharing data with um, the city for this recovery purpose, um, please let us know. But the, the principles, and it was really heartening and, and kind of reassuring to see that we had when we set up this recovery data partnership are many of the ones that were reflected around responsible reuse of data within the data assembly framework. So thinking about the scope of the data, thinking about specific applications of the data, thinking about having advisors who can look at the data and understand use cases, um, having some sort of time bound use of the data. So it's not just collecting data. And I think there, there is a, a great analogy that Marco brought in at the beginning of this like cyclonic swirl in a vacuum where the data just is sucked in and stays there forever. We want to use it for a specific purpose and make sure we're very clear about that. And then I think the most important thing where the greatest opportunity that I've seen in my work for misunderstanding or, or, or risk is, is around education. So with this recovery data partnership, one of the things that we're requiring all the partners to do is to share that they're part of this partnership. One of the things that we're doing is we are sharing the use cases that come out of it. So when an agency uses data for a particular purpose, we will be sharing more information on how the data has been used. It's something that's also fundamental to our work around open data. So as much as we can, sharing the ways that different people use this and enhance this open data, um, that makes it more usable for others. It may inspire others to do more. And really thinking about data education, I know this is something that a lot of the panelists have touched on as fundamental for civic participation um, in this day and age. Um, I think one of the examples just really briefly that came up a few times was um, the, the idea of, of the credit card data. And, and when you say to someone, we're going to use your credit card data, you think like my credit card number, you, you're, it's not quite clear what people are getting at. And I think that was actually one of the points of confusion in the, the data assembly among um, the, one of the mini publics. And just being really clear about what you're doing and how it should be used and, and the different assumptions that are baked into that data is, is really important and, and not sharing that is, it can be a really big risk. Great, thanks so much, Zach, and, and, and thanks for uh, sharing uh, uh, your observations with regard to the, the assembly, but also anyway, what you are working on. 
Uh, I think we have about <laughs> four minutes left. Uh, uh, we've had a, a very active panel here who had a lot to share. And, uh, and I think uh, I've learned a lot, uh, at least uh, from all of you, on uh, different uh, components and facets associated with uh, data reuse, but also with uh, the importance of actually a data assembly. And, and I think uh, we have a few questions, but I think many of the questions were already answered. Uh, and Alison, uh, who posed the question with regard to private sector involvement, uh, uh, we did have uh, private sector involvement, of course, in the data assembly, and Paul uh, was also uh, part of it. And, and, and we will also share the report where you can see some of the reflections, as uh, Zach said, some of the reflections of New York City residents with regard to different public sector data, uh, private sector data uh, uh, as well. Um, but I think uh, one of the uh, uh, key challenges, I guess, that was raised in the questions as far as I can summarize the questions in the next four minutes was how do you deal with the diversity of New York City? Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, that's always a challenge, of course, is that there are many communities, many uh, uh, different uh, concerns, many different needs. And so how should we anticipate the uh, diversity of New York City and their reflections with regard to data. And again, Nick, uh, that's probably something that you <laughs> encounter on a daily basis. Uh, so I would like to get your reaction and also in the remainder uh, 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 two or three minutes, uh, any other uh, uh, volunteer who wants to reflect on that, perhaps Gail as well, uh, on how do you deal with the diversity of New York City and embed that into at least a common set of principles moving forward. Nick. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, so to me, there are two sides of the coin. One side of the coin is there are um, sort of humanistic common um, experiences that um, those of us in government, our, our job is to understand and develop solutions for. But then to your point, uh, Stefan, to the questioner's point, uh, there are, are obviously uh, differences in people's experiences, right? So I think a piece of the answer is in one of the questions, which is it is important for those in government to be in close touch with representatives uh, of uh, different uh, groups that are in the city, uh, whether it's uh, LGBTQ-centered uh, activists or, or, or groups, whether it's those dealing with racial justice, uh, gender justice, uh, environmental issues. Um, so again, if you were at a citywide or a, bor a borough-wide uh, perspective, uh, that's sort of your starting point. And I think if you have a good cross-section of, of, of groups, you will then hear a lot of the different angles on the problems that we face. So again, as I try to say at the top, when it comes to COVID, for example, and uh, data use and reuse, uh, we know that, for example, uh, just to be even more specific, uh, the Latino community uh, had actually the highest uh, death rate in terms of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So then the question is like, uh, well, why is that? What are the systemic issues that emanate from uh, or, or, or that are apparent from, or maybe not so apparent, that come from uh, you know, those unfortunate um, stats? So it's, it's a matter of being in touch on the ground citywide. Um, and then even internally, when it comes to who we elect and who we hire as staff, mm -hmm. make sure that you're bringing on a cross-section of folks from across uh, our city. Like I, I think in the public advocate's office, and I know in the VP's office, we have a cross-section of staff that also come from those communities. And I'll just wrap it by saying uh, uh, we have a division called the Community Engagement Division, whose role is to do that uh, on the ground, staying in touch. Uh, and lastly, on this point, we have social media. We have a phone number and website. I do want to plug it real quick, advocate.nyc.gov. Um, that's our website. Uh, you can uh, go there and let us know what your opinions are. And, and our job is to be uh, responsive uh, and helping to push our friends, Zachary, and our colleagues in the mayor's office on those different uh, perspectives. It was a very good question. Great. Thanks so much, uh, everyone. Um, uh, we unfortunately reached uh, five o'clock and I'm sensitive to everyone's time. And I'm also sensitive that uh, um, uh, by five o'clock, uh, most people are totally zoomed out uh, at a time of uh, remote uh, engagement. Uh, this was extremely uh, valuable to us and hopefully to the audience as well. Uh, this was recorded, so we will share uh, more widely as well with everyone uh, who had an interest but couldn't attend at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. We will also embed some of the lessons and some of the sharing uh, in our final report, which we hope to launch uh, as soon as we can. And hopefully uh, uh, we will then also will 
uh, follow up with everyone on this uh, panel and with the ones in the audience to make sure that the principles and the framework that was identified by those mini publics also gets integrated and gets a fair audience uh, with regard to how data is being reused moving forward. Thanks again to everyone um, um, and uh, stay safe.